Hey fellow anime enthusiasts and fans of epic crossovers, welcome back to our channel. Today, we're diving headfirst into a world where ninja meets hunters and huntresses. That's right, we're exploring the incredible crossover of Naruto and the world of our WBY. But before we jump into the action, make sure to smash that like button to show your support and subscribe to our channel for more thrilling anime crossovers, fan theories, and exciting content. Don't miss out on the fun, join our community today. Alright, enough waiting. Let's begin the adventure of a lifetime with Naruto and the world of our WBY. Even legends sometimes long for an ordinary life. Sadly, their lives are seldom simple. You're certainly no exception. Life is an explosion. I once heard a madman say that. Oddly enough, those words stuck with me. Maybe he was onto something. He was blonde too. Just like me. Coincidence? I think not. Life really is a blast when you think about it. Just like people. Our lives usually bloom bright and fierce, then burn out. Short, sharp, and poignant. That was my mindset. Live life, make your mark, enjoy it while you can. But what happens when a man lives longer than he should? What happens when that proverbial explosion keeps going, building, enveloping all before it? Suppose I'm still asking myself that question. Haven't quite found the answer. When I first found myself stranded in this world, I was lost for a while. I fought for a time discovered a few new tricks, kept moving. I tried different careers, learned a lot of hobbies, but in the end, one path really stuck with me. Dust. I suppose you could call it the lifeblood of this world, remnants of a different age. It's not chakra, that's for sure, but the sheer potential of it, well, the results speak for themselves. That, and a mountain or two, but really it's not like anyone's going to miss those. Did I mention dust can be used in pranks? No, because it can. Once I discovered the sheer chaos, the choice was obvious. Didn't even have to think twice about it before I took out that first loan. To you, running a simple dust shop might seem like something of an odd choice. Especially for an ex-shinobi. For me, it seemed a simple one. When you've saved the world half a dozen times over and stranded yourself in a foreign dimension, there really isn't anywhere else left to go. You've seen all there is to see, done all you can do, and at some point just don't feel like fighting anymore. It's not that you can't or won't but that you simply choose not to. So you try to find a hobby, something that makes you happy, something that makes others happy, too. Let somebody carry on the good fight. Let someone else be the hero. Let something happen. My home was at peace when I left it behind. Probably still is. Even if it isn't, it's none of my concern. They probably don't even remember me, and it's not like I can get back to them. I've had decades upon decades to reconcile myself to that fact. When I first landed here all those years ago, I had nothing. I didn't want to be a huntsman, wasn't interested in any world-ending crusades, but I helped out a few people anyway, for a time. Gave a man a lifetime or two to set up his precious schools. Talked a man-queen out of burning the world. It paid off. Some might argue that I still have nothing to show for it. I disagree. Ah, oh, but where was I? Oh yes, dust. Dust is fascinating. There are so many ways to prepare it, and really, you can do just about anything with the stuff. Try mixing it with chakras sometime. You'd be amazed by the results. The SDC certainly is. Bastards have been trying to buy me out for ages. Not happening. Bloody schnees can piss off. Even now, Ian's after the fact, I'm still learning new combinations of dust. Hell, I've spent most of my savings learning what it means to be a dust specialist. There were mistakes, to be sure. Loads of them. Took me ages to master my craft. Burned down a building or two. Or three. Or four. Eh. Who's counting? But I learned, because I had the time. Uzumaki genes have their perks, I suppose. Or maybe it has something to do with Karama and being a Jinchuriki. I don't look a day over 20. Eternal youth has its perks, I suppose. Never asked for it, but it lets me live life at my own pace. In any case, I'm happy here. A simple life, with simple pleasures. Wandered the world, sowed some wild oats, and settled down. Nothing to worry about here in Vale, no crazy conflicts, just peace. Well, that and the odd explosion or two. Keeps life interesting. You know? Roman was having a bad day. The absolute worst sort of day, really. It had begun as it often did, with Cinder riding his ass, demanding yet more dust. Nothing unusual on that front. Grand schemes, the fall of Vale and whatnot. For that they needed more dust. Not just for them, but for the white-fanged, filthy animals, and that blasted train they were building down in Mountain Glen. Only problem was, he'd already hit just about every dust shop this side of Vale. You see, that was something of another problem, 
because Junior had lent him these men for the evening, and he was expected to pay them, which he couldn't very well do because apparently the rest of said shops hadn't had a chance to resupply after last week's raid. He'd spent the better part of the night. But then, miracle of miracles, he found one. It was a homely little place, all bright and orange and red. Bright colors everywhere, right on the corner. Festooned with large banners. Sparks and explosions. He read the plaque outside with a sigh. Celebrating 25 years tomorrow. His brow furrowed yet further. Somebody's having me on here. He pushed the door open with melodic cudgel and was rewarded with the faint chime of a bell above. The door itself swung open on well-oiled hinges, exposing a large space beyond. Well, at least someone appreciated the classics. For a moment there, he thought it was one of those fancy automatic doors or something. Huh. Larger on the inside, too. Funny how that worked. But you see, that wasn't important. The dust was. And by the brothers, did this place have dust. Jackpot. Rows and rows of it, as far as the eye could see. Welcome to Sparks and Splosions. A merry voice called from the counter. What'll it be? Junior's men filed in after Roman, grounding off the sail spiel before it could take off. Do you have any idea how hard it is to find a dust shop open this late? The teller looked up, already. Roman imagined the terror writ all over their face. SH, 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 he put in quickly before they could scream. Come down. We're not here for your money. Hand over the dust. The cashier looked up with an expression of utter boredom. Roman's calm evaporated. At a glance, he wasn't much to look at. Blonde hair, a bit of silver at the edges. Blue eyes. Whiskered cheeks. Handsome enough, but not enough to be noticed or remembered. He wore a simple orange turtleneck against the cold with dark slacks and a strange necklace, coupled with an odd, what was that? A headband or something. Had some kind of weird leaf insignia on it that Roman didn't recognize. May, probably not important. Oddly enough, there was a critter on the counter. A fox, of all things. Small and orange with nine flowing tails it looked harmless enough on the surface. Downright adorable, really. He found himself stricken by the strange urge to pet the damn thing. Blast it. Don't focus on that, man. You have a job to do. I'm sorry. The cashier spoke slowly, drawing each word out with great care. Are you robbing me? No. One of the men drawled. We're here to sell you Girl Scout cookies. The clerk tilted his head. You are? I'll take three boxes, then. Roman flung up his arms. Quiet. You. What kind of lunatic was this? Did he not realize what was going on here? Honestly, he was beginning to suspect that the lot of them were just. Off. None of them made any moves toward the teller, or was he the manager? Despite his lack of weaponry. No one moved. Not a single soul. You know, as Roman looked on, the young man stretched. You really don't have to do this. His back produced a harsh pop. You could just leave. Torchwick tugged his hat down. I really can't. If he failed here, Cinder would tear strips out of his hide. To say nothing of Neo. The blasted fire bitch had them under her thumb right and proper. The only way out was through. Through this one, if necessary. He didn't want to kill this mook, but he would if it came to it. At the end of the day, he valued his life more. You must be that Torchwick fellow. The teller leaned back, mildly bemused. Heard you've been raiding dust shops all over Vale. Was wondering when you'd come my way. Yeah, well, here I am. He flicked a gaze to his men. Grabbed the dust. His cane clicked when they didn't move. Crystals. Firm. Uncut. Hop to it. The blonde planted a hand on his chin but made no attempt to stop them. Do you have any idea who you're robbing? No. A tilt of the head. Does the name Naruto ring a bell? It did. But the memory was vague. So he lied. Nope. Not a one. Really? Wonderful. The man clapped his hands, startling him. I'm afraid it's been something of a slow night, you see. Had to send most of the staff home early. Give him the night off, you know. Melodic cudgel barked once, discharging a round into the ceiling. Bits of plaster sprayed down. An alarm went off. It was worth it for the frown his actions drew. He looked up, regarding the hole in his ceiling as one might a particularly nasty stain on his shirt. Blue eyes narrowed. Swept back to him. I'm afraid you'll have to pay for that. Pay? Roman choked down a snarl. Listen, you little shit. I'm not playing around here. Apparently, neither were they, because that furry little critter on the counter hopped upright. Then spoke. They never learn, do they? Its voice was low and deep. The growl of a creature who shouldn't exist in this world. It's always so nice to be underestimated. What the hell is that thing? Hey. Never get tired of that. The blonde agreed as he climbed to his feet. Hey. Melodic cudgel jabbed his chin. Hands where I can see, him. Old man. Old. The blonde sniffed in contempt. Hey. 
I'll have you know I'm only 9,000. You must be joking. I'm really not. Still, the whiskered fool persisted. Walk away, son. Something flashed through those blue orbs. Walk away right now, and I'll pretend this never happened. Roman gave him a shove. I'm not your son. No, the whiskered warrior steadied himself on the counter. You're not. I'm grateful for that. If one of my kids ever grew up to be an arse like you, I'd hang myself. Maybe we've been alive a little too long, Karama. He rolled his shoulders. Seems everyone's forgotten about us. Maybe it's time we reminded them. Roman's temper slipped its leash. Perhaps it was the stress that made him snap the way he did. Maybe it was the lack of coffee, or the fact that he hadn't had a smoke all night. Or maybe, just maybe, it was the infuriating bastard before him. Really, who could say? Probably the latter, though. It was too much. He'd had enough. No, more than enough. With a snarl, he cracked the manager across the face with his cane and sent him sprawling. I don't think you understand what's going on here. His weapon cracked down again, striking the back of the blonde skull when he tried to rise. You are being robbed. Each word brought with another blow, bending the bastard's body double against the floor. Do you understand? A hand snapped up, catching his cane. Metal buckled beneath clawed fingers with a shriek. Oh, blue eyes flickered into red. I understand perfectly. His free hand surged up, palm cradling a sudden surge of light within. Raisingan. It was a single word, but it became a hurricane. A snarling sphere smashed into Roman's exposed torso. Wall. Glass. Ground. In a heartbeat, these three words became the bane of Roman Tortwick's existence. His back struck the street and bounced once, twice, then thrice. On the third, he managed to get a hand out from under him. He soon wished he hadn't. It only turned his tumble into even more of a mess and shredded his aura even more, grinding him into a crater that left him wasted and gasping for air. No sooner had he righted himself than a large shadow fell over him. Well, he thought distantly as clenched knuckles filled his vision. Errors have been made. Naruto's fist slammed into his startled visage a heartbeat later. Roman's world shattered as he crashed through another wall. Pain didn't even begin to describe what followed. He physically blacked out for a second before reality reasserted itself. Once it did, he sorely found himself wishing otherwise. Black boots crunched against broken glass on the asphalt, jarring him back to wakefulness. Well, Naruto's voice hummed over the ringing in his ears. I think we can all say it's been an eventful evening. And as much as I'd love for you to stick around, I'm afraid this is where we part ways. Roman struggled upright and crawled away. Roof. His heart hammered in his ears like the drums of a wild hunt out for blood. His blood. He just had to get to the roof. The lunatic was close now, close enough that he could see the bastard actually glowing, shimmering with golden light from head to toe. If he could just get to the roof. The man's hand clamped down on his shoulder. Going somewhere? Let me help you. A vicious crack of the wrist sent him flying through the air. Where the hell was his backup? Another window shattered as someone rode one of his men outside like a toboggan. Right. The girl with a giant scythe. Nope. To hell with this. This wasn't his night. But at least the blonde was distracted. It was enough. Somehow, he made it to the ladder. A trembling hand tried to close around the lowest rung, pulling himself upright. He could hear the whine of a bullhead high above, promising him safety if he yet made it. Another hand closed around a second rung, hauling himself upright. Firm hands found him once again and dragged him down, denying him the safety he so sought. Run back to your master and give them this message. Baleful blue eyes met his. Keep the hell out of my shop. Then he launched him into the air. Ruby whistled softly and touched a pale hand to her forehead. Oh, wow. That guy really flew. Is he gonna be alright? She looked on as the shopkeeper silently sauntered over to his ruined window. The very same window she'd shattered when she kicked that suit-wearing hooligan. Terror dawned as she collapsed crescent rows behind her back. Oh no. He wasn't going to bar her from his shop. Was he? She whimpered a little as he glowered down at the glass. He totally was. New. Blasted. She heard him sigh. I just paid this place off too. I'm sorry. The words burst from her with such intensity that the owner jumped where he stood. I didn't mean to. He rounded on her with a sigh. You, forget it. You're not in trouble. Was that it? For a moment, she'd been afraid he might call the cops. He didn't seem all that upset about it. Weird old man. Well, not really old. He just had a bit of silver in his eyes. Silver was cool. He'd handled that bad guy so easily. Was he a huntsman? He looked capable enough, but she didn't see a weapon anywhere on him. Ex-huntsman, then? He blinked down at her. You have silver eyes. 
Ruby returned the blink with one of her own. Yeah, it's nothing. He shook his head. You just remind me of someone. Forget I said anything. She really couldn't. The words wormed their way into Ruby's brain and took root. Sue. Um, her little knees twisted in thinly veiled anxiety as she remembered why she'd come here in the first place. I don't suppose you have any high-impact dust rounds for sale? For sale, a small smile bloomed across his whiskered face. Kiddo, you helped me throw those punks out of my shop. For that, you get a lifetime discount. She perked up like a puppy. Ooh, discounts were nice. How much we talking about here, mister? Naruto. Not mister. His smile became a grin. How does 50% sound? Ruby's eyes got really big. 50. 50. Ruby squealed. Best. Shop. Ever. Her legs betrayed her. She didn't run. She vanished in a blur of crimson petals and struck Naruto's chest at speed. To his credit, the blonde reacted better than most, in that he braced his feet and only grunted a little. One hand came down on her head, stroking her dark hair. Without thinking, she leaned into his palm. Huh. The gesture felt oddly familiar. And then the faint click of heels against broken glass cut between them. Naruto let go of her as if he'd been scalded. Just as well, too, because when Ruby peeked around him, she saw someone far more terrifying. Another blonde, but the difference between these two was like night and day. That black and white outfit, those piercing green eyes, the way she carried herself, every part of her screamed danger. Huntress. Definitely a huntress. Maybe she could ask for her autograph? Hey, Glinda. Naruto dared a Johnny Little wave. Long time no see. Look, if it's about the shop, I already handled. I'm not here for you. The woman's crop flicked out. I'm here for her. Ruby squeaked. Me. Naruto quirked a brow. Glinda did the same. She whimpered beneath their gaze. I'm sorry. Naruto's broom attacked the floor ruthlessly. There were no survivors. The whiskered warrior hummed softly while he worked, sweeping bits of broken glass and shattered dust out into the street. It was slow going. Tedious even. Roman's men had made quite a mess, to say nothing of the hole he'd blasted in the ceiling. Really, he could have used his shadow clones to expedite the process tenfold by now, but it was the little things in life, things like this, that kept him going. It also gave him time to think, to consider just how he was going to make Torchwick pay for his transgressions. Or maybe you're just stalling. Karama yawned from his customary perch on the counter. We both know what comes next, don't we? Without missing a beat, the blonde swept up a bit of desiccated dust and winged it at the fox's head. If you can talk, you can help, he growled. I gave you the body for a reason. Fine, fine, twist my tails, why don't you? Cold blue eyes met his. You let him go. His partner stretched once and uttered a jaw hopping yawn as he hopped down to the floor. He's probably delivered his message by now. With but a flick of his tails, he righted a fallen shelf and swept the ruined merchandise aside. Now it's time to hunt him down like the dog he is. Him, his associates, everyone who knows his name. No one will respect us if we let something like this slide. True enough. When you were immortal, you learned to appreciate the simple pleasures in life. When you cease to age in the conventional sense of the word, you found meaning in the smaller things, the simple minutiae of living. When time could not slow you, when death was unable to hold you, you had to find things to live for, if only to stay sane. Surprises, for instance. No matter how long you lived, you could never know all there was to know, never see all there was to see, for each day there was always something new to find. It added that little bit of spice to life. Just the sort that kept an ancient shinobi going. Even the odd spot of bad luck could prove a surprise, a shock to break one out of a tedious cycle. It could also serve as a warning. Not to him, of course, but others. There was always a bigger fish out there, always a monster hiding under the bed. Today, someone had poked that monster. Roman's actions had been, well, less a surprise and more of a shock. A wake-up call, really. He'd been quiet too long, spent lifetimes getting this place up and running. Not for the cash, not for the reputation, but the simple joy of having something to call his own. People might wither and die, but a business, a legacy? Those were eternal. And one punk comes along, ruining it all. The handle of Naruto's broom cracked under his grip. Not just him, but Junior's boys. He recognized the Red Axe gang when he saw them. They destroyed no small amount of his dust. He'd be paying the club a visit, too. Karama was right. Maybe it was time to clean house. Time to remind the world why you didn't mess with a man's life. A phone rang in the back, cutting the dark spiral of his thoughts short. Blue eyes shifted to regard it. Glass and masonry crunched underfoot as he stalked towards it. Still it rang. Once. Twice. Thrice. 
It was an old piece of work, not a scroll, but a landline, corded and all, with a dial to spin numbers. He wasn't sure why he'd kept the blasted thing around. Nostalgia? Memories of a simpler time? Who could say? Karama hopped onto his shoulder. You gonna get that? Naruto didn't speak. He reached down, and after a moment's hesitation, picked it up. Hello, old friend. A familiar voice came through immediately. I heard about your shop. You have my condolences. You're in a great deal of trouble, Miss Rose. Ruby flailed her arms in a vain attempt to ward the words off, to no avail. They hit her like a physical blow, sending all her hopes and dreams crashing to the ground. Was this the end? Was she going to jail? No, she rallied her thoughts. This wasn't a police station. Miss Goodwitch had brought her here, wherever here was, but it certainly wasn't downtown. But why? She whimpered a little. I was fighting bad guys. I did good. You did. The man before her tinted his fingers with a sigh, but it does not excuse your crimes. You inflicted significant property damage on that shop. Right? Calm down. Remember, this wasn't a police station. This was probably Headmaster Oshpin's office, likely one of the many he kept around Vale. He couldn't arrest her, could he? Oh gods, what if he could? She didn't want to go to jail. She was too young, too pure. They'd eat her alive. Naruto said I wasn't in trouble. Her voice hitched a little. He did. Be that as it may, Oshpin winced, almost as if he were afraid of something. We cannot simply let you off lightly on this. Am I? Her voice warbled and she swallowed once to recover. Am I going to jail? That depends. The ancient hunter blinked. Do you wish to? She made a keening noise through her teeth. New. That was a joke. Here at last his countenance softened. You'll simply be repaying your debt to Mr. Uzumaki. He laughed a little as she collapsed like a wet noodle in her chair. You will work in his establishment on the weekends, until such a time as your debt is repaid. Wait, why weekends? Because, he continued with a smile. I suspect you'll be quite busy with your new coursework in the meantime. New what, now? Ruby's heart skipped a beat. Then another. Another still. Wait, 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 wait. Surely he wasn't suggesting. Was he? Whoa, she managed. Oshpin leaned forward and offered her his hand. I do hope you'll be less rambunctious and beacon, Miss Rose. Was he moving her ahead two years? A full two years. Ruby's heart held back to life, turning her pale face a bright shade of red. Full steam ahead. All systems are a go. Forward, forward, forward. She lunged across the desk and clasped his hand, pumping it up and down like a madwoman. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll be the best huntress ever. Do not thank me, dear girl. He withdrew, rubbing his arm with a wince. Thank Naruto. He called in a favor and a personal favor. That chagrin smile returned, more rueful than ever before. Now then, I believe your mother wishes to speak with you. All of Ruby's newfound joy turned to ashes in her mouth. Meep. Any chance you can, I dunno, pretend I'm not here? He sighed. I'm afraid that Fox is out of the bag. Wait, that's not how you say. The door slammed open behind her, cutting the girl short. Ruby rose. A familiar voice cried. You are in so much trouble, young lady. Roman was late. On a certain level, Cinder wasn't surprised. One could hardly trust a common criminal to keep their word in this day and age. No honor among thieves and all that. Roman had always been surly, and it wasn't as though he had chosen to cooperate with them. He and Neo had been forced into this arrangement, like so many others before him. Still, was it so wrong to expect a little professionalism in this day and age? Their place of meeting wasn't much better. Golden eyes flicked about, regarding her surroundings with nothing short of disdain. What had Roman called this place? The club? How droll. Even a private room such as this was too dingy for her tastes. Too much red by half, to say nothing of the wine. It wouldn't suit her needs. For now. Honestly, it galled her. She couldn't wait to be rid of this filthy city. If it wasn't the bad wine, it was the people. At least Emerald and Mercury had the good grace to be silent. Perhaps they'd sensed her mood. Perhaps not. She didn't much care at the moment. When Roman finally stumbled in, she considered killing him out of principle if nothing less. The man looked awful. His white coat was tattered and stained, his hat horribly dented, and good gods. He reeked. The smell alone was nearly enough to make her eyes water. Only her finer instincts prevented her from pinching her nose outright. Had he gone swimming in a dumpster? Where have you been? Such a nice boss I have. Torchwick collapsed on the couch opposite her all but sprawling himself out without a care in the world. How are you, Roman? How was your day, Roman? Why do you look like crap, Roman? Cinder exhaled slowly. Must. Not. 
kill. This. This was why she loathed working with common criminals. Always so crass. Always thinking of themselves and nothing else. Always so small in their worldview. Never once thinking of the bigger picture, nor the long term. For all his flair and panache, Roman was no different. Ah, but he was speaking to her, and she must attend. Her gaze flitted over him, noting the curious lack of the case she'd given him. Where's the dust? Don't have it. A slender brow rose. Excuse me? Some guy threw me out. He sat up with a growl and began massaging his dinner hat. Beat my ass then kicked me to the curb like I was nothing. You cannot be serious. Cinder's mouth twisted and a grimace fused with a snarl. Worthless fool. You lost to a common shopkeeper? Of course not. Roman's voice cracked like a whip, surprising her with its intensity. What do you take me for? Many things. A fool. A lek. Hired help. But she'd assumed he was at least reasonably competent. Now it seemed that assumption was all for naught. Disgraceful. He'd gone with a score of Junior's men, meaning he was hardly alone at the time. And yet here he was, broken and battered. She leaned forward in her chair. Was it a huntsman? He winced. Well, no, but... So he had lost to a civilian then. Deplorable. A strange nagging sensation tugged at the back of her thoughts. Surely not. What were the chances? She folded one leg over the other as she poured herself another glass of wine. Her luck wasn't that bad. It couldn't be. Yet that thorn of doubt continued to tug at her nonetheless. It just wouldn't let her be. Curious. Do you recall the name of this shop? Eh, it was some dinky little place. Roman shrugged. Nothing special. Sparks, explosions, I think. Weird name. No. Joke's on him, though. He chortled, unaware of her dread. Junior's boys really trashed the place. No, no. Way I see it, he'll be out of business for weeks. No, no, no. Cinder's blood was no longer cold in her veins. It was ice, frozen completely. She could barely breathe. This was a bad dream. It had to be. She pinched her left arm, only to wince his pain flared through her limb. Not a dream, then. This was terribly, horribly real. Fury heated her heart, breaking her free from her frigid stupor. You must be tired, Roman. She whispered at last. Come here. Have a drink. He had her warily, but yielded beneath her state. Don't mind if I do. Like a good little worm, Roman did as he was bade. She poured, filling his cup to the brim. Roman accepted the glass that was offered and drank. His glass clinked against hers. Cinder waited, watched as he downed it in a single gulp, her body coiled like a viper. She counted to three, two, one. Then she surged out of her chair and buried a fist in his gut. Torchwick doubled over with a rasping gasp and vomited what he'd just imbibed. Red liquid spattered the floor. Cinder callously flung a nearby cloth at him. Clean that up. You wasted good wine. Absolute ingrate. He did so, wasted and gasping for air. A minute passed. Then another. Another still. Behind him, Emerald gulped. Cinder, should we leave? Stay, she hissed. What? Roman rasped as he looked up at her. What did I do? It's not what you did that angers me so, Roman. Cinder stood and poured herself another flute of wine. It's who you did it to. That friggin' nobody? Roman wretched where he lay on the floor. What about him? It was just a dust shop. What does it matter? Fool. Imbecile. Idiot. She wanted to shriek at him for what he'd done. That friggin' nobody, as you so eloquently put it, is Naruto Uzumaki. Instead, her golden eyes flashed over the rim of her glass as she drank. He once was an associate of ours. Those eerie burning orbs closed for a moment, then opened again. Do you know what we call them? Roman gulped. I'm going to find out, aren't I? She muttered a phrase in a language he didn't understand. His visible eye squinted at her. What was that? Japanese. She took another drink. He taught me a bit. The closest translation would be, the boogeyman. What? He climbed to his feet with a groan. You call them a demon? Well, Naruto wasn't exactly the boogeyman. She sat and crossed one leg over the other. He was the man you sent to kill the boogeyman. His face paled. Oh. Naruto is a man of focus. Thrice as quickly she stood again unable to stand still. Commitment. Sheer will. Her forehead pressed against his. Something you know very little about. I once saw him kill three men in a bar with a pin. He looked away, and she snarled at him. A bloody pin. Roman. Then suddenly one day he decided to leave. Her visible eye flashed with golden flames. He never said why. He wanted out. We made a deal. A truce. Her lips peeled back in a snarl. And then, Roman, a few days before the anniversary of said truce, you raid his shop, destroy his stock, and smash his windows in. 
To be fair, he hedged. That last bit was the kid, eh? I do not care. Cinder rounded on him with a hiss, temper still and spent. Her glass struck the wall and shattered, spraying bloody wine everywhere. Roman recoiled. I can fix this. Oh, she cocked a slender brow. How? Torchwick actually stood a little straighter, the fool, by finishing what I started. Didn't he hear a word I said? Cinder cast a despairing glance at Emerald, then whirled and drew him into an embrace. Naruto will come for you, and you will do nothing, because you can do nothing. But he let me go. Only to send a message to me. She pulled away and touched his cheek. There is nothing he loves more than the thrill of the hunt. Her palm caressed his face. I should know. He taught me a great deal, after all. I suspect he'll be paying Junior and his men a visit as well. But you. Without neither word or warning, her hand twisted, striking him. Roman's head snapped to the side. You have endangered years of planning. Flame leaped to her hand, promising pain if you raised so much as a finger against her. All my schemes will be not because of you. She brandished the globe of fire at him with intent. Count yourself grateful I don't kill you here and now. Get out of my sight. Roman got. The door slammed behind him. Cinder whirled and began to pace immediately thereafter. She had to fix this. She must fix this. He could ruin everything. Would ruin everything. She couldn't hope to stop him. Few could. Oshpin himself turned a blind eye to his activities, catered to him, appeased him, for fear of provoking his wrath. Nor would Salem dare involve herself in this. Which meant. She reached for her coat and donned it quickly. I'm going out. Ma'am? Emerald flinched but a little. I don't understand. Do you want us to come with you, Ed? No. Cinder paused, realizing how shrill she just sounded. No, she repeated, forcing her voice to regain its calm tenor. That won't be necessary. She had to speak with him. Did she still have his old number? Of course she did. She committed it to memory. Something told her a phone call would be, insensitive if she didn't visit afterward. Fine. In person, then. It presented a great danger to her, of course, to say nothing of her pride. But there could be no risk without reward. Call first, then a visit. Right. So be it. Face to face it was, then. Nothing else would suffice. Damn Roman to hell. In the shadow of Junior's club, a knife found a man's throat. The bouncer in question went still. No, it would be better to say that he froze. He ceased to move, blink, or even breathe. Every fiber of his being locked up as those words whispered in his ear. His mind became intimately aware of his surroundings, of the darkness, of the man standing within it, of that cold, cruel steel hooked against his jugular. His very soul gibbered for mercy, pleading that if he was just quiet enough, that if he just didn't move, then maybe he'd be left well enough alone. Hello, Francis. You look good. No such luck. The guard dared a threat of breath and turned his head just so, hoping to hell he was wrong. He was not. Baleful blue eyes gazed back at him, set within a whiskered face framed by messy blonde hair. He discarded his shopkeeper's attire in favor of a crisp navy suit with a striking red tie, darker than blood itself. On anyone else, it would have been gauche. On him? It was a reminder. This man didn't need a knife to kill him. That he had brought one at all said more than most. He was being kind. This was a man who had shown him mercy once in the past, a man who allowed him to reform and change his ways. He wondered if he would be shown such mercy a second time. Mr. Uzumaki, he swallowed once as his voice broke. Now, now, don't be formal. But look at you, you've moved up in the world. A smile touched the blonde's face. Lost a bit of weight, have we? Francis swallowed again, unable to mask his accent for fear of what might happen if he did. Fifty pounds, fifty men inside. He prayed his associate understood the warning. Naruto inclined his head just so. That's good, good. A hand patted his back, pulling the pistol from his belt. You won't mind if I take this, will you? He didn't have much of a choice, did he? You couldn't fight this man. You could try, but you would die. The gangs had tried once. Once. Never again. And he didn't want to die. He had a family. Grandchildren in Atlas. He wanted to see them again. Oh, gods. He didn't want to die here. Are you? Here on business tonight? I'm afraid so, Francis. Blue eyes flashed in the dark, gleaming red in the glow. Why don't you take the night off? The knife slowly fell away from his throat, jagged metal kissing skin, but not breaking it. Francis, report. Junior's voice hissed through his earpiece. Any sign of him? Francis tugged out the earpiece with trembling fingers. Only then did he turn to face him. Thank you, sir. All he found was empty air. No one was there. Knock. 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 
It was the sound of doom, a steady thud 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 that echoed against the door. Three knocks. Like drums out for blood. Junior knew it in his soul. He'd known at the moment his men started screaming behind that door. Known that there was nowhere to go, nowhere to run. Nowhere he could possibly hope to hide where this creature couldn't find him. So he didn't try at all. Even as the door buckled and shook, even as the last of his gang died bloody, he stood at the bar, bottle in hand, and drank. Liquid courage fortified him, not enough to make him drunk, but it was all he had. All this, for a single mistake. It was just a dust shop. How was he to know that thing lived in Vale? He'd never been told. Or if he had, he'd forgotten. He wasn't sure which. He couldn't remember anymore. He wasn't sure he wanted to, not after the sounds he'd heard. The doors crashed open, and his killer stalked over the threshold at a brisk pace, eyes narrow and intent. There wasn't so much as a drop of blood on him. Not a one. A mountain of bodies behind him, and not a drop of blood anywhere other than his weapons of choice. Blue eyes met his. You know, I never did like guns. His knife flicked out once, carving a scarlet smile on the last man's throat. The fool went down with a bloody gurgle. So uncivilized. Wouldn't you agree? Melanie tried to bar his path, bless her simple soul, and was summarily swatted through a wall like a straw doll. Mitya made the same mistake and joined her sister not a moment later. Hay winced at the awful sound that followed. He wasn't even sure if they still lived. No, wait. They were groaning. Thank the gods for small mercies. Because he had the distinct feeling he wouldn't be receiving any. Where is he, Junior? I don't know. He dropped the bottle and raised both hands to show himself harmless, I swear. Honest to gods. He was here an hour ago, but he left. Do you really want to start a war with the underworld over this? You misunderstand. This isn't war. This? His hand rose. This is pest control. Junior raised his hands higher, shielding his face. I didn't know it was you. And now you do. The rejoinder was swift. Are you sorry? Yes. I swear. I didn't know. If he had, he never would have lent Roman those men. The knife came up under his chin. Tough. She, Junior, warbled and broke. She won't let you get away with this. Yes. Something flashed through those cold, dead eyes. She will. She won't. You truly believe that, don't you? His killer regarded him for a long moment. All right. I've got time. He kicked out a seat for him. Sit down. Junior did no such thing. To sit was to die. I don't think. No. Naruto snarled. You don't. Now sit. Down. Junior sat. You see, there once was a man. He found a full glass and knocked the drink back. He was a soldier of fortune, a mercenary who traveled the world. He wanted for nothing, needed nothing, and yet despite that, he decided to share his abundance with someone who was less fortunate. An orphan. Fourteen years old. An urchin with nothing to her name but a pair of swords and the clothes on her back. A kid who had, by all rights, been used and abused from an early age. Troubled. Prone to violence. Stop me if you've heard this one before. Junior gulped. No. Go on. I will. Thank you. Naruto hummed his thanks. So this good man opened his home to this girl, and when she stole from him, this good man loved her anyway. He took up a fork and began to carve away at his meal. When she failed in school, this good man showed understanding and patience. A piece of steak came and went, swallowed in a single bite. When the girl lied and cheated and clawed and fought, this good man showed compassion until the girl who had never felt anything like being wanted or loved, finally did. It was a miracle, no two ways about it. He set his fork down, and the silence stretched between them. One week later, the girl killed the good man. Naruto slammed his glass down, etching a crack in the fine material. Junior's gaze followed it, mesmerized. You see, the girl was afraid. She was scared that one day, the good man would wake up and realize she wasn't worth it, like all the others in her life. That little fracture etched itself deeper now, becoming a deep fissure. She couldn't bear the thought that this man, this good man, would throw her away like that. So, he took up the fork and made a slashing motion across his throat. She killed him. Only then did Junior glimpse the scar there. The glass split, sending both halves tumbling to the table. But then something incredible happened. Naruto took a hold of each and laid them atop one another. The good man didn't die. He got right back up, pulled the blade from his neck, and smiled at the girl. A faint glow stemmed from his hands, and Junior vaguely felt a flash of heat. The man did not chastise the girl for her crimes. He simply held her close, as a father would, as no one ever had before. He gave the glass back, now free of imperfection completely. Care to know what he said? You're going to tell me, aren't you? He made her a promise, more a vow, really. 
Naruto steeped his fingers and laid his chin atop them. He swore to her that he would never lose faith in her, never hurt her, never betray her trust. His head tilted just so, shadows falling over the right side of his face. He taught her a few tricks after that. Small things that a child like her could use. Why did he have the worst feeling about this? What happened to this girl? When she was old enough, the good man let her go. Naruto's smile had too many teeth. He kissed her forehead and gave her his blessing, sent her out into the world to make her fortune. And she did. He leaned back at last, his tail complete. Would you like to know her name, hey? Some small part of him already knew. No, it couldn't be. The chances of that, it just wasn't possible. Naruto leaned in. Warm lips brushed his ear. Cinder. That name broke him. Cinderfall was a stone-cold bitch. He'd never seen her express so much as an iota of emotion for anyone. That was just it. She cared for no one. Nothing. The idea that someone had raised her, even if they weren't her blood, it threatened to unman him, because it meant she would never go against such a person. You didn't mess with family. She wants to destroy Vale. A brow quirked. Is that what you think? He did. She said as much, hadn't she? Unless she was lying. So you see, Junior, a scarred forehead pressed against his. That's why she won't do anything. I raised that girl. A spark of gold burned through those cold blue eyes. Took her in when she was at her lowest point and made her what she is today. Told her she could be whatever she wanted to be, so long as it made her happy. He shrugged carelessly. Maybe I should have disciplined her better. Suppose I'll have to after this. Why? Hey whimpered. Why tell me all this? Because I wanted to make things perfectly clear between us. The rejoinder was swift. You see, I know you're wearing a wire, just as I know Roman's listening in on our little conversation. A hand came down on his right shoulder, all but fastening him in place. Don't worry. Hey, you're going to live. He's going to hear every bit of this. I am? You are. His head bobbed. You've done me a great kindness. You see, I'm a merciful man. A knife slammed into the table, burying itself to the hilt. So I'm going to make an example out of you. What? Your left eye or your right? Cold dread coiled in the pit of his stomach as those words damned him. I'll make it quick. Painless, even. A low smile creased those whiskered cheeks as his gaze swept down to the knife. I hear eye patches are all the rage these days. Really, I'm doing you a favor. You'll have ladies beating down your door. It was the best offer he'd get. This or death. Looking at it like that, the loss of an eye was a small price to pay. Left, sir. He swallowed once and closed his eyes. The knife blurred at his face. Clench your teeth. Power was complicated. There are many different kinds, of course. Physical, mental, emotional. Blunt. Subtle. Power came in many forms, but at the end of the day, it all boiled down to respect. For it was respect that built the foundation of fear, and with it, wariness of said power. And like it or not, Naruto knew a thing or two about power. When you lived this long, it came to you naturally. Power was the reason she'd come to visit. The door squeaked open like a fearful field mouse, the bell above it chiming mournfully. Naruto looked up from his cleaning. Well, well, look who it is. Cinderfall slipped inside, puffing out her chest to make herself seem larger than she was. Adorable. He remembered a different time not so long ago when she'd hunched her shoulders inward, trying to be small. Trying to hide, not just from him, but everyone. Everything. When she'd been a tiny, gawky thing, gawping at everything in sight. To him, she was still very much that girl. You look well. She reached across her body and gripped her right wrist. How have you been? Well, you said with some heat. More than you clearly seem to be at the moment. What the hell were you thinking? She laughed, and it sounded forced. I didn't intend to it. Cut the crap. Cinder chuckled again, then. This time her laugh was not that fake, cultured thing. It was soft and low, raw and dangerous. The sound one predator might make toward another. She knew better than to intimidate him, if only because she knew it wouldn't work. He'd hoped she wouldn't become something like this. I haven't forgotten your lessons, she said, smiling. Not a single thing. He checked a smile of his own. Then why are you here? Cinderfall was no fool. She knew she'd been caught. Naruto raised his arms. Well, he quirked a brow. Aren't you going to give your old man a hug? Her face flamed with color. Daddy. No. Daddy. Yes. He wiggled his arms. I haven't seen you in years. You don't write. You never call. His brow darkened. You send your goons to wreck my shop. That wasn't me. Her eyes flashed with panic from her younger days. I only remembered the name by chance because you mentioned it once. How was I to know you actually went through with that harebrained scheme of yours? A silence stretched between master and apprentice. 
In the end, Naruto shrugged. He supposed that was fair. It wasn't as if he'd advertised his new business to old acquaintances. Only a handful knew what he was doing these days. Just the way he'd liked it. Unfortunately for her, it didn't absolve her of guilt. And how was I to know the girl I raised became a common criminal with plans to destroy an entire kingdom? I'm not. She looked aside. I don't wish for the destruction of Vale. It's complicated. Naruto didn't lower his arms. Wanna hug it out? Must we? Yes. He grinned. We must. Cinder rolled her eyes and walked into his waiting embrace with a huff. Her chin came down over his shoulder as his arms clasped her by the back. She fought for a moment, then succumbed with a put-upon sigh, the sort a surly teenager might make toward an overly affectionate parent. In many ways, she was still a little girl to him. She always would be. Even if he had to, discipline her every now and again. So, he grinned down at her. How have you been? Still going through that conquer the world phase? She growled and wriggled in his arms, to no avail, his grin was strong. This isn't a phase, daddy. He pulled her a little closer to him. HMHM, sure it isn't. So? Plans. Tell me. Now. His foster daughter sniffed once. And if I don't want to? He patted her back. Then you get a spanking. She went terribly still. You wouldn't dare. No? Care to test your old man? She told him everything. And he laughed. All right. You can do this. Summer Rose whispered the words to herself as she approached the dust shop. You'll be fine. She spurred herself forward in spite of her fear. It's only been 15 years. Sure. 15 years of total radio silence between the two of them. Summer's confidence. What little she had left. Threatened to shrivel up at the reminder. 15 years since their last mission together. And she'd not spoken to him since. It wasn't fair. How was she to know he'd been so close, and yet so far? She was all but mumbling by the time she grasped the handle. Her feet cemented themselves to the floor, refusing to budge another inch. It was all she could do to psych herself up. She could do this. She was a huntress. A silver-eyed warrior. She'd face down grim time and time again, escape certain death, and live to tell the tale. She could do this. She would do this. Just be brave. She only had a few minutes to do this. Ruby would be reporting for her first day any minute now, and she had to get this out of the way before her darling daughter arrived. Trembling fingers twisted the latch, and she heard voices. Simply doesn't warrant the damages. Was someone there? Summer stilled, unwilling to interrupt. Gentlemen, she heard him then, the low timbre of his voice muffled through the wood. It seems I've been away too long, that I've been forgotten. Silver eyes peeked up through the door window and beheld a familiar face near the entrance. His face. Just as she remembered him. Are you really trying to shortchange me here? He spoke unto two men, each wearing crisp white suits. Familiar suits. One of them muttered something less than flattering. Thought so. This reeks of Jacques. He's meddling again, isn't he? All right. Here's what we're gonna do. Naruto climbed to his feet and moved around the counter. If you schmucks don't pay me the insurance money that I am so rightfully owed for the damage and why shop has suffered, he jabbed one finger into the left man's chest with intent, your head, he whipped around and jabbed a digit at the other, is going up his arse. There was a silence as one of them replied. He sighed. You sure you want to ride this train, little man? You can't touch us. This time, the response came through loud and clear. The SDC would have your hide if you harmed so much as a hair. His words peeked into a ghastly wail as the blonde grabbed him by the face and moved. An awful ripping sound filled the air, punctuated by a second scream that had no business coming from a grown man's throat. Cloth ripped. Something else. Tore. Rapid footsteps approached, and the door swung open in her face. Summer dove out of the way. Two men soared out, conjoined in a way no one wanted to imagine, and crashed into a building. They were still screaming when someone stalked out the door past her. Excuse me. A young woman all but stumbled past her, pale face sick with nausea, bright eyes half-lidded in embarrassment as she covered her mouth with one hand. Summer had all of an instant to take her in. Clad in a deep red dress that clung to her curves like sin, she was a beauty like no other, golden eyes sharp and framed by long, lustrous midnight black dark hair. Then she was gone, heels clicking harshly against the sidewalk. Don't forget to visit tonight. A familiar voice called at her back. The young woman pivoted in place and flipped him the bird before she stalked off. Summer's heart sank, and all her courage withered as a flower would in the dead of winter. Nope. Couldn't do it. She whirled to flee. A thorn of concern pricked her heart and held her back. Naruto was in many ways the wind. He could be calm and gentle, a cool spring breeze to those he loved. 
But when his wrath was roused, when he was angry, when someone took something from him, well, she had seen the results firsthand. Hurricane, tornado, cyclone, there weren't nearly enough words to describe the absolute avatar of annihilation he became. After all, one did not simply leave the life of a shinobi behind. A life like his followed you. It clung to you, infecting everything you were, everything you loved. If there was even the slightest chance that anger was directed at Ruby, unlikely as it may seem, no. She couldn't risk it, no matter how embarrassing it might be for her. She had a duty as a mother. Duty trumped fear any day. So she plucked up her courage and darted into the shop before that fear could get the better of her and sent her scurrying. Keeping her body low to the ground, she skirted a broken shelf and poked her head around the corner. Quietly now, quietly. Broken glass crunched underfoot, and she was betrayed. Naruto looked up, caught in the process of toweling his bloodied hands with a damp cloth, and granted her a small smile. Hello, sweetie. Summer's heart skipped a single treacherous beat. Irk. Silver eyes were drawn inexorably to blue, and without thinking, she yanked her hood up. Without the glass acting as a barrier between them, she could see him perfectly, just as he could see her. Really, it wasn't fair. He hadn't aged a day since she'd seen him last. Nope. Not fair. Not fair at all. Belatedly, his words caught up with her. The smallest of pouts tugged at her lips. Thought I told you to stop calling me that. You did. He granted her a crooked grin as he leaned against the counter. I chose not to listen. There's a difference. So, his head cocked to one side, rather reminding her of a certain fox. What brings you to my shop after all this time? What do you think? A familiar yon arose somewhere behind her. She obviously wanted to check in on you. Her gaze found Karama's false form easily enough. He'd all but curled himself up on a pillow near the counter, much like a cat. Anyone else would have thought him an adorable little fox, albeit one with nine tails. She knew better. She'd seen things. As she looked on, the small fox raised one of his many tails in a lazy greeting. She found herself returning it before she caught her wrist. Are you angry? Both man and beast blinked. Why would we be angry? That was it? Seriously? Just like that? Oh, gods. They weren't even mad? It would have been so much better if they were. Anger. She could have dealt with. Sorrow. Tears. Anything but this. He was just happy to see her and Karama with him. She hadn't expected them to be so calm, happy to see her even. Had she really come all this way for nothing? Summer? Fine. She leaned on a shelf, only to wince when it crashed to the floor and fell apart at her feet. Oh, you know, I was just in the area. I don't blame Ruby for the damage. His words were a knife, cutting her fears to the quick. It wasn't her fault, you know. Her shoulders slumped. Oh, thank God. I mean, after all, Naruto favored her with a rueful smile. She's mine, isn't she? Ack. Double irk. How? Isn't it remarkable how four little words can make you come undone? Just like that, all of Summer's carefully wrought plans and schemes were falling apart. She'd come here intending to be an adult about all this, come under the pretense of checking in on him, making sure he was alright after all this time, not plotting Armageddon on his enemies. She hadn't intended to broach the subject of Ruby's parentage quite that bluntly. How? Ty's been dead for a while, Summer. Naruto picked up an upturned chair and plunked down in it with a sigh. I may be a lot of things, but I'm not blind. Speaking of which, her brow furrowed. That woman I saw earlier. Cinder, the blonde blinked. What about her? Are the two of you? What? No. He recoiled and made a face. I adopted her a while back when she was just a runt. She was just paying her respects and promising her support. It was a good explanation. Too good. Paranoia reared its ugly head despite her best efforts. So you're not. I'd rather shag a cactus than shack up with a girl I all but raised. Thank you very much. For all his fire and strength, Naruto had always been something of a bleeding heart where children were involved. It sounded so very like him to pick a girl off the street and take her under his wing. His words to her earlier made sense. He told her to come back tonight. And the way she rolled her eyes at him, even flipped him off, those weren't the acts of a lover. Why did that make her feel better? Just to clarify, she swallowed once. I'm sorry about the way things ended. He scratched at a whiskered cheek. That makes two of us. Shit happens. People move on. Have you? Naruto's head snapped up. The rest of him went curiously still. Anyone else might have been concerned by the sudden intensity of his gaze. Not Summer. She kicked at the cracked flooring with one boot, unwilling to meet his eyes for fear of what she might find there. Blasted. She hadn't meant to say it like that. Treachery. Bad brain. 
This betrayal would be remembered. I really haven't. There was a curious note of longing in his voice, when she remembered all too well. I missed you. She peeked at him through her hair and watched his right hand curl into a fist. Me, too. Her heart twitched. She really had missed him. It really was a stupid fight, wasn't it? I'm sorry I snapped at you back then. He sighed. Do you even remember what we were fighting about? Her head bobbed in a tiny knot. She did. She tried to change him once. After Ty never came back from that god-awful mission. She'd been hurting at the time, lashing out in blind grief, trying to make him something he wasn't. It had been a futile attempt born from pride as much as selfishness. Some things just weren't meant to be changed. It wasn't possible. You couldn't alter the color of the sky any more than you could snuff out the sun. Years of self-reflection and being a single parent raising two girls helped her to realize that. And he was standing here before her, looking every bit as miserable as she felt. Well, that simplified things. Yes, that simplified things a great deal. Summer crossed the distance between them in a silver streak. Naruto caught her by the hips and reeled her in. Strong arms closed around her, pulling her into a warm embrace. She yielded to it with a soft sigh and buried her head in his chest, reveling in the faint scent of dust and fire he exuded. Blasted. He really did give the best hugs. And he was so damnably warm, or was that her face? Hard to tell. I'm sorry, she mumbled against his jacket. For all of it. Silence was his sole response. Come back. Please. The dam broke and words spilled forth. Ruby needs a father. She looked up at him, silver eyes shining with unshed tears. She needs to know who you are. Her voice warbled a little as she thought of Yang, not hers by blood, but her daughter all the same. I know Yang isn't yours, but she'd love to meet you. His arms trembled a little around her. I think I'd like that. When he tried to pull away, she held tight. Summer? Nope, she muttered. You're mine now. Never letting go. Reigniting their passion could come later. For now? She just wanted to savor this. It felt good to have him back, like she'd reclaimed a little piece of himself. Here in this moment she didn't care about the past, where he'd gone, who he might have been with, or any such hypothetical concerns. She was first. She would always be first. I'll talk to Ashpin about the insurance. She babbled into his chest, mouth running away with her. I know he told you about Ruby working here, but you won't even have to pay her all that much. We'll get this sorted. He chortled a little against her. I take it you saw that last bit with the insurance agents. Saw it. She slapped his chest. Half a veil probably heard those too. Did you really have to shove that guy's head up his? To be fair, I'm fairly certain they were working for Jacques. Jacques Schnee? Her smile froze. Oh, is that so? I just might have to pay him a visit. Personally. Naruto frowned. Summer? No. Summer? Yes. Ahem. And then Kurama opened his big mouth. If the two of you are quite done making eyes at one another, we have a store to run. Summer scowled at the little red terror. Oi, watch it, Fox. Oi, watch it, Huntress. He sang right back. If the two of you want a canoodle, get a room. Preferably one far away from me. You're entirely too noisy. I can wait. Naruto nudged her hip with an elbow. You can leave out the back when you're ready. Then can we stay like this? She leaned up and kissed his neck. Just for a little while? Naruto didn't use words. He simply held her. It's good to be back. Sometime later, Naruto sprawled in his chair with a rueful smile. Kurama hopped onto the counter to join him and curled up there with a scowl. Stop grinning like that. You're contagious. That cleanup took entirely too long, did it? He sighed and crossed both hands behind his head, too content to take offense. Did it really? Yes, a tiny tail swatted his arm. Because he refused to use shadow clones. Really, if you just stopped holding back. Nah, he waved a hand. Where's the fun in that? Comfortable silence stretched between them as they lazed about. Neither spoke for what felt like an eternity. Someone might have sought to fill the void with aimless chatter or traded further barbs among themselves, but they didn't feel the need. Both man and beast knew one another well enough by now and didn't feel the slightest need to do so. There could be only one course of action from here. So? Kurama yawned at last. I know what you plan to do, but how do you intend to go about it? For now, we'll let the gears of Veil turn. Naruto considered the ceiling with a sigh. Roman will stick his head out sooner or later. He can't hide forever. And then? Then we chop it off. He made a sharp cutting motion with his good hand. Once and for all. You do realize he may well send someone after us in the interim. A blonde brow arched. And? Fair point. The bell above the door chimed once as someone opened it from without. Karama perked up. 
Naruto's posture shifted just so, his upper torso leaning forward as a knife flicked down his sleeve and into his hand. Summer had only just left, and Cinder wouldn't be returning until later this evening. Junior knew better than to send anyone after him. So then who? A familiar voice called out to him when a streak of red and black blurred inside. I've come to work. His fingers twitched and it vanished from whence it came. Oh, he leaned back, concealing it's just you, Ruby. Now that he knew what to look for, he really could see the resemblance as she scampered through the door. She was Summer's daughter all right, but beneath that he saw something else, those ever so faint dual whisker marks tripling her cheeks. Ruby was quick on her feet, almost unnaturally so. Something told him that if he turned his senses on her, he might find the faintest stirring of chakra coils there. He chose not to, if only because she wasn't alone, and for fear of what he might find. No, she wasn't alone at all. That was most certainly a belladonna on her right, and a shni on her left. He'd known a few of both during his heyday, and more recently. Mercifully, neither looked a thing like him, or perhaps they simply took after their mothers. In theory, it shouldn't be too hard to conceal whiskered cheeks with a bit of makeup. Perhaps he was being too paranoid. Wow, a low whistle pierced the gloom. You really did a number on this place, huh, sis? He recognized Raven and Ty's brat last. One, because she brought up the rear and two, it was absolutely impossible to miss the blonde bombshell. Arms crossed behind her head, she craned her neck to and fro, surveying the damage to his shop with keen lilac eyes. The last living piece of Taeyong Shaolong in this world. It almost hurt to see her. Really, he'd have to pay Raven a visit one of these days and smack some sense into her. Ruby made a keening noise akin to steam escaping a tea kettle, snapping him back to reality. Yane, I already told you. That wasn't me. Well, she paused and cast about, as though seeing the damage for the first time in broad daylight. Maybe the window was, and possibly a shelf or two, but still, not my fault. You don't. The shni palmed her face. Do you not know the meaning of restraint? I do. The little reaper flailed her arms. But there were so many bad guys. Narido took mercy on her at last. Why are you here? Eh, she jolted a little, startled by his inquiry. Ah, Ashpin said I have to work for you on the weekends, until I paid off the damages. He knew that, of course. He just said it to make her squirm a little. Really, he couldn't help but tease her. Ashpin really was a cheeky bastard, making her work for him like this. Probably afraid of pissing him off. That, or this was his way of getting back at him for forcing Ruby into Beacon two years early. Really hard to tell with the old geezer. Plans within plans, that one ever trying to gain an advantage while keeping him placated at the same time. At least Salem made some modicum of sense, every now and again. Now that he was back, he might need to check on her, too. Wouldn't do for her to get too big for her britches. So many heads to crack, so little time. I appreciate it, outwardly, he merely quirked a brow. But, well, there's not much to be done right now, still waiting on the insurance money. He looked past her. So, is this your team? Ruby made her introductions with all the energy a 15-year-old could muster. No faulting her for that. Young he knew, and the dark-haired one was Blake, such a familiar name, but there at the end. Hmm, his gaze fixated on Weiss in particular. A and, and I see a schnee. Why am I not surprised? Everywhere I go, there's always a schnee. Weiss absolutely bridled. Excuse me? You're excused, he flicked a hand at her. Now buy something or get. I know you're good for it. He half expected her to burst out in a sputter of denial. She did not. Points to her. What came next forfeited what little good will she'd earned. I've heard about this place. Her gaze flitted about, considering what little intact stock he had left. Your dust is supposedly second to none. He caught the gleam in her eyes at once and didn't like it one bit. How much would it take to buy you out? A muscle jumped in his jaw. And oh, a hand snapped up, vetoing her. Why do you silly schnees always think you can buy me out? Is there a price tag on my forehead? Ah, uh, no talking. He jabbed her forehead when she tried to speak. Schnees never have anything good to say. Really, your mother was the only exception. On a whim, he decided to twist the knife. Be sure and tell her to visit sometime. He wriggled his fingers once and laughed as she recoiled. Real lightning between the sheets, that one. One last wistful sigh stole the fight right out of her. Those were the days. Yong whistled. Ruby gagged. Blake, wait. Why was she taking notes? He supposed it didn't matter. Weiss had already died inside. He saw it in her eyes. X. Excuse me? You're excused. Again. He smiled. A speechless schnee was a good schnee. Feel free to pick your jaw up off the floor at your leisure. Karama chuckled. 
it would prove his undoing. Because the very moment he did? Why, Ruby noticed him. Oh, she cooed, eyes all but aglow with stars. Is that a fox? Karama placed his chin atop one crimson paw. I am no mere fox, mortal. Holy crap. It talks. She all but squealed with joy. Is it a toy? No. Wait. Toys don't talk like that. Hmm. Blake pulled in from the side and actually had the gall to pick him up. Looks rather lifelike to me. Karama bared his fangs at her. I will bite you, Belladonna. She remained unbowed. Very lifelike indeed. Joke's on you. Young elbowed her partner. You should see the stuff this one reads. She's probably into that crap. Blake dropped Karama like a hot potato and slapped at her arm. Bah, kids these days. He'd seen stranger things eons ago. Really, biting was tame nowadays. You know, Naruto thumbed his chin. I think I might have written a book series once or twice. Still do, in my spare time. His fingers drummed against the counter as he grappled with the vague memory, faded though it was. Ninjas of something or other. Karama huffed. Smutty trash, more like. Blake pivoted, regarding him with a narrow look. Do you mean? Ninjas of love? Ah. He snapped his fingers. That's the one. You've heard of it? I'm thinking it's about due for a sequel. He wasn't sure he liked the gleam in her eyes. Was she drooling? She was. Can, the young fauna gulped once. Can I get your autograph? Karama rolled his eyes. Look what you did. Ignore him. He's a big softy. Young scoffed. Heh. I bet. It was the straw that broke the fox's back. Karama buried his head in both paws and muttered something less than kind. Right. You brought this upon yourself, Bramwin spawned. Know that I will show no mercy. What are you gonna do? She booped him on the nose. Bite my ankles? The rest of his words hit her a moment later. Wait. Bramwin? You know my mom. No. And hate. Came the snarl. Rip and tear. Then he pounced on her. To be fair, he's nice to most people. Naruto shrugged as Young reeled back, clawing at the angry Bija now tearing at her hair. You should see what he really looks like. Young wailed. Get off, you damn Kitsune. Off, off, off. You cannot comprehend the amount of tales I do not give. And? Weiss quirked a pale brow. What does he really look like? Is this a joke? Weiss, no. Ruby cried. Karama reacted before Naruto could even hope to warn her. In a single bound, he leaped from Yang's hair planted himself on the desk, and whirled to meet the sullen Shni. His fur stood on end, all nine of his tails rigid as red spikes. For an awful moment, nothing happened, and Naruto wondered if his partner had lost his touch. And then, a towering golden maw filled the entirety of the Shni's vision. Boo. Weiss toppled backward with a startled shriek. Yeek. Naruto shook his head with a rueful sigh. Well, this is my life now. He won't get me. Roman whimpered in the dark. I won't let him crazy bastard. I'll show him. Cinder returned that very evening. Much to his amusement, she was not alone. Welcome back. He looked up as the bell rang. Any news for me? Not quite. Her face was a curious study of contrasts, equal parts concern and anticipation wrapped up in one package. She squirmed like a naughty little girl with her hand caught in the cookie jar. Fond memories. She'd been such a wild and cultish little thing back then. I thought it best to introduce my associates. Under his watchful eye, she nudged two teenagers forward into the light, to prevent any confusion in the future. This is Emerald, she gestured to the girl on her right, a dark-skinned youth with green hair and striking red eyes, and the boy is Mercury, her left hand indicated the pale silver-haired boy at her side. Please be kind to them. Naruto looked down at them. Up to Cinder again. Down once more. Really, there was only one conclusion to make. You have kids? Cinder's eyes all but bulged. Daddy. No. Her hands clamped down to stifle the outburst, but it was too little, too late. Wide golden eyes narrowed as she realized she'd been had. Really, it was all too easy. Wait a hot minute, Mercury give a startled blink. You're her old man? Because I don't see the resemblance. There isn't one, you louse. Naruto feigned a jab at the younger man's head. I adopted her when she was about, um. He held out a hand and levered it above the counter somewhat. I'd say about this tall. Cinder whimpered. Mercury sniggered softly. Really? Emerald all but twitched. You adopted Cinder? Karama cackled. Blunt. This one. I think I like her. Mercury blinked. Is that a talking fox? Sure is. Naruto didn't bother to contradict him. I was fixed on Emerald. What? Did she adopt you too? Yes, sorta. The tan shrugged. I mean, she took me off the streets when I was younger and... Wait. 
he saw the moment her thoughts clicked into place. If you adopted her, and she adopted me, she held up her hands counted, doing the math before turning a hopeful expression on him. Does that make you my grandfather? Naruto's brain fizzled out. You've doomed us. Cinder all but sank into a chair. Here we go. Wait, Mercury frowned. What? I don't get it. Naruto did a double take. Blinked. Once. Twice. Thrice. Now. Then he inhaled deeply. Karama absolutely hissed. Don't you dare. Too little. Too late. I have a granddaughter too? Cinder groaned into her palms and doubled over. Daddy. No. Daddy. Yes. Naruto slammed to his feet. This is wonderful. I must tell everyone. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, simply tap the screen to explore more captivating stories we're sure you'll adore. And please, remember to show your support by hitting the like button and subscribing to stay updated on our latest stories. Don't forget to check the description for the author's information.